podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to this next episode of The Therapy Show with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. And we're going to go straight into part two of working with a client with borderline and the clinical implications of that and possible treatment planning. How do how do we work with that client? Okay, so I'm going to name two names. I'm going to name um, Masterson, who's the so-called expert on you know um, writing about how to work with the borderline condition, and a Gestalt therapist I really like called Eleanor Greenberg. They put either of those names into Google and they'll come up with lots of literature how to work with the borderline condition. Let's start with uh, what I talked about, the dilemma in the last podcast, is that basically somebody come from this position has problems in the separation individuation phase. In other words, how they separate out, be individual, rather than being the prisoner of the caretaker or, or, or mother in this position. So Eleanor Greenberg had a monomic, which I like. Um, for people who watch, listen to the special, the um, narcissistic podcast, Eleanor Greenberg had a monomic, uh, monomic called Special God. Yeah. Now, but for the borderline position, she has a very apt monomic and it's called Misery. <laughs> now I'm smiling uh, I, on a podcast you can't probably see me smile but anyway <laughs> because you know sometimes you know it can feel very miserable when you're in a therapeutic battle with a borderline yeah and uh, and the trick of course is to take supervision so you can actually stay outside the process so it's misery so let's go through it yeah very good way of thinking about how to work with borderlines is to remember the monomic of misery. So M is for mother. Okay. Now, as I say, the basic position is um, for borderline is mother issues that they haven't been able to separate or individuate from the mother. And they fail, fail to do that or Perhaps it's the father, you know, the primary caretaking. I'm per- glad you said that, Bob, because we always get the stick for stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they fail to, um, if you like, separate. They fail to get the, the recognition, support, admiration from the caretaker figures whilst they're doing the necessary separating process. That's why I say mother issues. Yes. But of course it could be father if the mother's not around or if there's two fathers, for example. But yeah. uh, uh, it's important. I've, Eleanor Greenberg called it mother issues, but that's the dilemma. The next one would be I, misery. Remember, I, yeah. I would stand for identity problems. So they have two basic identity problems problems one is what i've just talked about is the part that i saw in the last podcast where they move to a helpless um regressed uh young sense of identity if you like and the other one is when they switch to this other part which is always uh fear of abandonment and will move to rage and uh will move to extreme anger in an attempt to um keep the caretaker connected but it doesn't work so their identity and also their identity is often um uh very very young they don't grow up so they haven't got a grown-up identity they have yeah. an identity which is very very young yeah yeah so that's one thing to because if you think about it if you can think of this in child developmental terms then you are able to separate out from the counter transference and be more grounded in the clinical treatment. Yeah, uh, so now we're into S. Yes. 
S is for splitting. I said there's a, there's a big split between the two halves of the self. Sometimes Masterson, I think, calls about the real and false self. Um, but anyway, two parts of the self where they, and I've just talked about the split. They see things in very black and white terms, just like young children do. Yeah. There's no, no sense of grayness in relationships. This is how it is, or this is how it isn't. Yeah. And they will split from the side, which is very childlike and aggressive, and often seen as very passive, to the other side, which is very rageful, angry, and fear of being abandoned. And they're locked out from both positions. Both of them, though, are an attempt to keep connected to the primary caretaker. Now, if it's in therapy, of course, connected to the therapist. Yeah. Therapists probably, unless they know this material, won't understand that at all. If somebody's raging at you, they won't see it as an attempt to be connected usually. No. Yeah, yeah. But again, that, that rage, you know, is covering up a real fear of abandonment. So there's fear underneath that rage that's coming at you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's not just I'm a bit scared that you're going to not see me next week. This is, like you say, this is real deep-rooted life and death survival stuff going on here. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, another thing for a therapist to think of, what's this E? which stands for engulfment stroke abandonment. So their fear of being engulfed, so they can never grow up and never be an individual. But they are on top of that, they have a fear of being abandoned as well. So a huge fear of being engulfed, just like their mother engulfed them, because it means that they can never be themselves, they never think, they have a sense of autonomy, no sense of growing up, never a sense of spontaneity, all the things we're talking about. So then they, they stay, as I said, usually what happens, they'll either escalate one part or escalate the other part in an attempt to get connection. Yeah. Either way, the therapist, if they don't know this stuff, will not find it easy to stay grounded in their adult. Yeah. Do... Does this link into the injunction stuff about don't be you and don't grow up as well? Is that what you would work on in, in the therapy room? Well, I, I, I know I, I know I, you know, my identity is a TA therapist for many, many years and I teach people to be TA therapists. I don't actually think transactionalist language much when I'm thinking of this psychodynamic child process of a borderline. But however, if I did think about it and now although because you've asked me, Yes, don't be you, don't be yourself, be yeah. what I want you to be, probably the biggest, don't be yourself, be what I want you to be, don't exist, yeah. don't feel, don't think, don't grow up. Don't do anything, yeah, just don't. don't. Say that, yeah. Yeah. All the injunctions are there. Yeah, yeah. So, so the child will then have to adapt to survive, and usually what they move into is, oh, I've said, this childlike, passive over adapted position in an attempt to kill, keep the mother or the projected person in the relationship but then of course they feel engulfed or they feel the person's going to abandon them so they move to a rageful position yeah both positions are an attempt to keep connection but actually in real life pushes people away yeah and in fact, there's many book, books written, and one of them that I like um, is for the for the lay reader. And is of course, it's walking round. What's it called? Walking round on eggshells. And it's a bit like if you're in a relationship with somebody who comes from this unstable, contradictory position, then it is like walking around um, them on eggshells because they're because the other person is afraid of anything that they do. The person will either go to extreme rage or extreme neediness. Okay. Yeah, I can I can see how that would work. <laughs> it's kind of like you don't you as the other person in the relationship, you don't want to be seen to wake them up to a certain extent because whatever you do, it's going to be wrong. Yeah, that's right. 
whatever you do is going to be wrong. And that's what the yeah. therapist will feel. Yeah. The therapist's counter-transference will be, you know, definitely along those lines. Whatever I do here will be wrong. Yeah. Now, if they've got a history themselves, in their child ego state, where in their own history, which is whatever they did was wrong with their own parents, then they're going to be highly stimulated. Mm. Yeah. Because as therapists, we are only human. <laughs> that's right. And, you know, I think, I think, I personally think that these issues will come out very quickly in the borderline process. And for the young therapist, they are, they'll need to take it to therapists. But if they get to a place where they can't cope, they might have to refer on. But of course, they are then in a really difficult position because that is the you know, real abandonment. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where does all that, I know we, we've got the, the R and the Y that we need to finish off, but where, where does all this fit in with where we sometimes step into the client's story in order to reparent and step out again? Is this something that you would stay well clear of with the borderline client? Yes. Okay. That's the, in a nutshell then. Yeah. <laughs> Other stuff. The first thing you need to, and I'm going to talk about it, is, is provide boundaries, provide structure, yeah. provide continuity, provide confrontation, provide yeah. uh, adult reality test testing. Yeah. Not an attempt to do reparenting. Now, by definition, by providing all that, you are providing. Well, yeah. Experience. As long as you don't give up on them uh, and uh, and say, oh well. You know, I can't cope with this. I'm going to pass you on to the other therapist, and then you've got to reenact of history. Yeah. But, but so we are, in a way, providing a different experience, but it's not stepping into their uh, early emotional life. Yeah, it's with with structure, with boundaries. Yeah, yeah. we do yeah. confrontation rather than an adult reality testing, rather than reparenting. Yeah. Yeah, and. I would imagine, again, it's about that potency of being, you know, no matter what they're throwing at you, if they come out as that helpless child that is feeling abandoned and lost and they're throwing lots of emotion at you, please don't just, just let me, I don't know, have longer in a session or see you more regular or prioritise me above whatever it is. That's, it, not, that's a trap for the therapist. Yeah. If you start doing that, where do you end? But that's what I mean. It's about us being important yeah, that yeah, we yeah. we keep them yeah, yeah, yeah. in in that safe space, as opposed to getting drawn into all of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's very easy to get drawn into it. But you are correct. So rage are on our misery monomic. Yeah, by Eleanor Greenberg. Just put into Google. Loads of stuff on it. Or Masterson. And, you know, in terms of stuff on that. Is for rage. R is for rage. Which is a big part of this. Yeah, fear, they're, they're, yeah. They're, they're fear of being engulfed and fear of being abandonment. And of course, they are hyper vigilant for anything that may indicate that. And they will move to rage and devaluing, annihilating as quick as a flash. Yeah. Because they that they want to keep the therapist, not the opposite, but of course they push the therapist or the whoever away so and they feel their range and their anger is so deep it goes on forever there's no boundaries it's boundless it's an abyss yeah yes yeah, an abyss because they are they are rageful and not being able to be themselves yeah they're also terrified that the other person will abandon them and that can bring rage as well and the range is, they feel it's like, will go on forever. It's mm. a core, core issue. Yeah. Because in their mind, they've tried everything to make it work and it's not working. Oh. Yeah. And so the therapist really needs to understand this dilemma, I hope, and stay grounded in the process. Not so easy, but at least take it to supervision if you have a problem with it. Yeah. If you have a problem yourself with conflict or setting boundaries, 
or confronting people. This is the wrong client for you to work with. Which again puts you in a really big dilemma. If you know, if if this doesn't manifest itself until a few sessions in, if you know you are quite a young, newly qualified person, and you're you know six, eight, ten sessions in before you realise, hey, up, there's something amiss here. Mm. Then, then what do you do if you are referring on? because you haven't got the skill set that will be seen as abandonment by them yeah it's, so it's, that you kind of you are in a no-win situation yeah you're in a vein you it's it's just, it's just almost impossible yeah but you need to leave as quick as possible don't allow it to go on if you were in fact if you after three or four sessions and you experience this stop but make sure you pass one because the longer you go into this the more entrenched this will be and the yeah. more they will reenact this out yeah so why yearning yearning so yearning yearning they yearn the child in them yearns for perfect love you know they yearn, they yearn for the other person who will give them what they call perfect love and Almost like 24 hour non conditional devotion. And they will never leave them for one minute. So it's like a symbiotic, in my, in my uh, frame of reference, hell, in their frame of reference, Nevada. Yeah. Because that person will give them. The perfect love they've never had without any conditions at all because in their history they only got love of course if they adapted them in a certain way so it's very conditional yeah but their yearning is that someone will come along give them perfect love never leave them never be away from this so far you know it's a bit like a slavish love yeah. But in their head, it's perfect love. Yeah. Which, again, you know, if you look at the early days of therapy or the early days of a relationship or the early days of a new job and all that sort of stuff, we're, we're replaying the cycles of development. So we go through that honeymoon period where we want to be together all the time and everything. But then comes the individuation and separation phase of a relationship that is just going to trigger all this stuff off. So you might be six months into a relationship before you start to see any of this behaviour being displayed. I think the borderline, yeah, I know what you're saying, and that's true. With a borderline, it's so quick, though. It's so if you know this literature, if you've been trained in this, you'll know this literature, and, but the, and you will spot it. The biggest trap, though, especially for the beginning therapist, is that they believe they can cure the borderline and they usually believe they can cure the borderline person by helping them and helping them and helping them and of course it's, it's the complete opposite mm. so in terms of treatment planning then the first step will be to really provide boundaries boundaries <laughs> boundaries, boundaries yeah boundaries and structure yeah so boundaries mean things like this if you have 50 minute sessions with someone you don't go one second over the 50 minutes yeah um that you expect them to um survive in maybe in their adaptive way from session to session you know um uh it, I wouldn't even suggest you had telephone calls. Mm. But, you know, if somebody is going to have a telephone call with a borderline client or accept that telephone call contract or text contract or whatever you like, then that must be really kept and specified to say two minutes or three minutes or five minutes or if it's an email, you know, 15 sentences. It needs to be really, really spelled out. Yeah. I would suggest that you don't have telephone contacts even if it's for business even if it is only for business yeah you know, because once you open up 
a passage outside the therapeutic room, then you could be opening yourself up to problems. Yeah. Now, I understand that if that person has missed the bus or if they can't make it or then I, I think you may set up a contract around logistics for text, emergency text for that. But you must have no costs moving to a therapy process. Mm. But you, they're going to be throwing everything at you. Mm. You know, even when you're saying then the sessions, if it's 50 minute session, you can't go one second over. I, I know that I've had situations where suddenly they strike up a conversation about the next session or I might have to go somewhere, but I might not. So I'll let you know whether I can. And they just come out with all this stuff just to make it stretch that little bit further or that doorknob comment as they're going out or something. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. But, you know, if you know this material, then you'll be on guard against all this. Yeah, which it, it, across the board with all clients, it's good to have boundaries and structure. With these clients to the nth degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's across the board, then it's not something that you're having to think about putting in place. Mm. You, you know, would you see this client more than once a week if they wanted more contact with you is that how you would bypass no. that by seeing no. them extra in a session no the first thing to do no. okay not in my opinion i think you need to start as you start off so um so look other therapists listening on may disagree with me here so it's a matter of professional thinking i think if you start off once a week you stay at once a week yeah you don't reward them for their uh, escalation. Yeah. Because it could be seen as a reward for their escalation. They can't think, they can't feel, their emotional work, they want to commit suicide. And if you don't commit suicide, I need another session. If you don't give me another yeah. session, that's abandonment. And then reenacting the history, just like my mother did, you're a bloody awful therapist. They take an ethical complaint out of you. I'll get hold of your emotion, your regulator body, and I'll make sure you never work again. So I want an extra hour of your time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I can see, but this is, this is what I was saying earlier on about them laying traps and... and you know manipulating the situation you, you you have to have very firm boundaries yeah they will tempt all the things i've just said very fast yeah yeah and that's one of the things is that they go from naught to 60 what you were saying earlier on about it's it's a very quick switch very very quick switch and i've supervised many 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 therapists have had tremendous problems personal professional crises and haven't known what to do mm. so this is very very common what we're talking about yeah yeah but and i can understand it because you kind of painted yourself into a corner you're stuck what do you do either way you're not going to win no no you cannot you cannot repeat you cannot win yeah the only way you can treat these people effectively is to start off with strong boundaries strong structure yeah understand that they will idolize you and they'll need to idolize you and then what they'll do is they will move to being helpless or report being helpless they'll move to escalating um not thinking they'll move to uh many manipulative techniques so that you will move into helping them in some way so how do you connect on, on a, a therapeutic level with these people? Well, number one, you have to stay in adult. And what I mean by that is you have to stay the age that you are. Yeah. And you, you need to stay grounded to be, able, to be able to think clinically. You need to know this material that I'm talking about. You need to understand the separation, individuation, drama that they're attempting to resolve or play out. So that will give you some compassion. And I think it's through your compassion and understanding the child's confusion and their need to, well, they need to 
get out of this drama they're in and see that if they keep enacting these destructive behaviours, they will always stay in a drama-filled place. Yeah. So the second thing you need to do, I think, once you've provided boundaries and all the structures I'm talking about, and this isn't necessarily linear, you may, under, you may spend a long time talking and learning about their trauma history. But, so don't take it particularly linearly. No, but anyway, I've called it number two. So you need to, and you might want to call this even educative therapy, but you need to teach them or let, let them know of the consequences of their destructive behavioral patterns. Even, yeah. as, even if it is straightforward as when you are like this with me, I am X. Yeah. When you're like this with me, even though you might think that I may change these boundaries here, that is not going to happen. And if we look at what normally happens to you in relationships when you attempt to do these things, you know, and they then explain what happens, you start sort of showing them that their acting out and their destructive acting out doesn't resolve things today, but actually makes things worse. Yeah. So you're appealing to them to start thinking, to stay an adult and to understand connections between, you know, their acting out and, con and their destructive behaviours. Now you might want to call it educative therapy if you want to. I think it's, I, I'm quite happy with the word ed educative therapy actually, but you're helping them make connections between, you know, their acting out of destructive behaviours and whether it works or not and obviously it doesn't work so then they start making connections and hopefully thinking about things yeah yeah so if we look at the thought feeling behavior they would they would generally be doing the behavior stuff yeah yeah that's right and yeah absolutely so you are permit you are encouraging them if you like to think yeah. and to work things through now, what will usually happen then, of course, is that as they start to take some responsibility about thinking and ownership of those connections, they will then probably start acting out in some ways because they're going to have a fear of being engulfed like they were by their original mother or the therapist abandoning them. So it's very important then, number three, which I'm going to talk about here, is that you do not reward them for their crazy, I'm saying crazy in loose terms, yeah. like massive helplessness and um, thinking distortions. So you don't reward them in some way. Yeah. For being young, for not thinking, for acting out as a helpless three-year-old when in fact they're a 35 adult, uh, 35, 40 year old adult in front of themselves who can think, otherwise they'd be brain dead. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the snippets and the moments where they are thinking in their adult as in the age that they are and having a conversation, that would be mm. noted in the session. Mm, mm, yeah, mm. yeah. If you reward them, you, you, you're going you're gonna to fall into a trap. You have to challenge that helpless, yeah. aggressive, crazy or compliant behaviour directly. Yeah. If yeah. you don't, you will net history with them. Yeah. I get that. I've, I've seen that. I've done that. Yeah. Okay. So another point in this list is you also need to encourage them to express their internal feelings and their internal world instead of repress them, repressing them or adapting to what they think you might want them to do. Yes. Yeah.
So the major goal, when the people come in from this type of profile, they usually come in because they have problems in relationships, maintaining personal relationships or friendships. They're usually the contract or the major goal on what they want, and this is why this link links into the yearning position I'm talking about, is they want to be in a stable, loving, nurturing relationship. So if you've gone, you know, like I said in therapy, you started to teach them that their behaviours and their acting out is pushing people away, then they may be able to start integrating some of these things. But that I think that should be the major goal, right? The, the, the major trap is that when they start to... <clears throat> how can I explain to you? <clears throat> when they see this as the major outcome, the major goal, and they pick somebody who they see as nurturing and all the things we'll talk about. As soon as they start to what I'm call masses and call self-activate and grow up and start thinking and functioning for themselves outside the relationship, yep, yep. Then, they will, then they will usually, usually start doing all this stuff we're talking about and, you know, uh, be afraid of abandonment and manipulate more and, uh, push people away and move from idolizing to devaluing very quickly as soon as there's that stimulus of them attempting to grow up yeah yeah so they once be they playing. engage their thinking and start to be more adult then the abandonment comes because yeah because in their mind they're fixed so you're going to leave me <laughs> yeah because <clears throat> in very simple terms if I self-activate, my mother will die or go crazy. Very bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. Which in that young place is, is a lot. Mm. Yeah. And you ever hear of that very famous song by Patsy Klein called I Fall to Pieces. Mm. That's what they feel. That's what they fear. One of the things, just to finish off on with this, that, you know, I, I can kind of connect with or see as, as one of the the big things around this is the word confusion. Oh, they're very confused. Yeah. I've, I've seen that on the face of clients, oh. literally. Yeah. You know, you, you think we're just getting somewhere and then there is literally a look of utter confusion that goes on. Well, they're very confused emotionally um, and they're, 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 they're terrified of... Um, their mother dying crazy, going crazy or abandoning them. So they have to go to all the extreme measures they can to keep the mother alive. So they might get some um, love. And that's what they do with the therapist. Yeah. Now, yeah, I've given you what I think is the sort of way of working with them, and what to look out for. Uh, can they actually um, get there and maintain stable emotional relationship? Yes, I think they can to an extent, but it's only. But it'll take a lot of practice. Yeah, yeah. And I would also teach the partner about. I do educative therapy with the partner to what to look out for as well. Yeah. So I'd probably, as we work through the um, whole of therapy issues with the client who's come in, if they've got themselves into a relationship in the way we're talking about, I'd probably ask the, I'll probably do some couples therapy actually. So in order to help the partner have some sort of education around this. Yeah. Which again, you know, 
would make sense, particularly couples, because then they're yeah. involved in the conversation and involved in the process, and it's it's an open book that there's there's nothing covert going on that's going to catch them out or anything. Oh. Mm. So challenging clients in terms of the counter transference particularly in terms of how the therapist might react to the challenges and the traps and the out of awareness manipulation yeah um, so a lot of supervision will be needed and probably a lot of therapy might be needed in terms of the therapist as well and this is long-term work two three four years minimum yeah and i think it is as i said uh, they may get their goals met to a certain extent but they'll need to do a lot of the therapy we just talked about and i also think include the partner in the process as well towards the end yeah Yeah, because they're going to be the ones that witness the change in behaviour. You know, they're, they're going to see. And when we make a change, whether that's through therapy or some other way, we need to kind of keep our hands on the steering wheel for a while until that becomes, we form a new new habit. And, and if we're stressed and overwhelmed or, you know, something happens, we can kind of revert back to the scripty stuff that we've always done. So it's... You know, this client might go at some point, two, four, six years down the line, but then might need to come back at different times because, but if you're that constant object, if you're that secure person that they can come back to if and when, then that's good. That's going to be a benefit to them as well. Well, it's interesting if you just think about it with this particular client, they have a morbid fear, a morbid fear of abandonment. Mm. So endings, in other words, be therapy ends, yeah. is really, really important. Yeah. To talk about well before the ending happens. Yeah. Like six months before, three yeah. months before, yeah. two, all, all the way down the line. Yeah. So it's an end in a healthy way because they've never had endings in a healthy way. Yeah. They haven't. This is all about helping the client separate, being an individual, being powerful, taking yeah. ownership of their own thoughts, feelings, and destiny, and at the same time, being able to maintain a relationship. Yeah, yeah. That I can be individual and together in a relationship with you, which that for me, I think that's where that confusion comes in. How mm. how does that work? I don't know how to do that. No, and they, how yeah. to be independent and in a relationship. That's right. Yeah. And they certainly weren't allowed to experiment or grow up and resolve that dilemma. Mm. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, and I say I think the biggest tip I can give the therapist is lots of supervision and lots of therapy and say that um, it is long time work and also can be very rewarding and satisfying. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, I think one of the things that, that I would say as a people pleaser, you, you know, that, that's part of my history is, you know, to maybe be on high alert that you don't get drawn into that vulnerable, helpless part of them and step into that, that enactment. That's right, because if you start re rewarding that type of behaviour, yeah. Um, actually, therapy won't happen. Yeah, no, no. What you'll get is what you just said there, is at its best an enactment of the historical drama. Yeah, which is why as a therapist, it is so vitally important that we are self-aware, that we know we know who we are in that room as well. And the, the transference and the counter transference and all that stuff yeah. is all running in the background. Yeah, and then you usually come to therapy with relationship issues. Yeah. That's usually, and of course, that's a general term for a lot of people coming. 
Yes. Yeah. When, when you start assessing them, this was in the other podcast. If you see big, very quick movements in the ego states, or you see a shift in one part of their personality to the other, and they talk about many of the things we talked about in the last podcast, think first about whether you can work with them. And even if you do take them on, and even if you do take them on, don't go too far into the therapy if you think that you aren't able to work with this type of person. Far better to refer them on right at the beginning to somebody yeah. who's more experienced in working with this type of separation, individuation issue, than stay in it when it becomes more and more hard as the terror intensifies for the client of you leaving. Yeah. Because if that happens, they will escalate their destructive behaviors and usually in a usually both of you then are in a very challenging position so are we going to do histrionic next time bob we keep saying this we We've will get one, i'm going to spend it one and two we will okay. get the histrionic i think i think uh what we haven't got to either is the antisocial person either right so, we do need to move up to the antisocial and the histrionic and also, um, yeah, we must do that next time. Okay, doc, I will hold you to that. So I shall see you next week. You will do. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.